including a very highly active star called Eta Carini. And this star is actually two stars, very massive stars that are orbiting around each other. And in some cases, they, it's, one's in a highly elliptical orbit around the other, and they come close to each other. These stars are so massive, they burn their energy very rapidly, and they're not going to last very long. Their lifetimes are short. Sometime within the next 100,000 years or so, this system of two very massive stars is going to blow up. It's going to become a massive supernova, possibly a gamma ray burster. It's going to be an intensely energetic object, and it's only 7,500 light years away from the Earth. The nice thing is, at that distance, we think we're, we're protected, so we don't have to worry too much about the impact. But astronomers, within the next 100,000 years or so, are going to have the opportunity to observe, and ordinary people are going to have the opportunity to observe an extraordinary flash of light in the sky and to study it. Now, what you see coming off to the right there is the new observation with the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph. There's that long, dark slit that you can place over the, the image of the object, and you can collect light point by point along that slit. And at each of those points, uh, the light is spread out into its component colors, and you can see a spectrum that corresponds to each spatial point along the slit. And in this particular case, this was taken last June, uh, the two stars had just passed through their moment of closest approach, and there was a lot of energetic activity happening. Um, I, I talked to Mas Mike Massimino and the rest of the crew before the mission, and I said, one of the things we really need to do, we've been monitoring this baby. It's so dynamic and so energetic. We've been monitoring this since 1997, and then we had to stop in 2004, and we haven't been able to continue the story. And, and so now, in fact, thanks to you guys, we're back up and running, and the story continues, and we can continue to monitor how this star is changing over time and look at its dynamics and get some understanding of how someday in the future this is going to become a really spectacular fireworks show in the sky. So that's the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph story. The next uh, image, please. Okay, this is a cluster of galaxies called Abel 370. It's about 5 billion years away from us. It's a group of galaxies, large and small, that are all gathered together and held together by gravity. In particular, they're held together by the gravity of dark matter that's within the cluster. It's, it's not just the luminous matter in the galaxies you see, but there's about five times more material that's cold dark matter that we don't really understand what it is. But this, all this material together exerts enough of a gravitational force that it can bend light as Einstein predicted in his general theory of relativity. So the light from galaxies that are beyond this cluster, are, the light rays are bent as they pass through the cluster and come to us, and they're focused like a crude lens. So this is called gravitational lensing. This particular cluster was one of the early examples of this that astronomers came to understand as, a, as an illustration of how Einstein's gravitational lensing works. And in fact, you see that long, bright arc up in the upper right. It was known back in the 1980s that that was a, an example of a gravitational lens. The power of Hubble, though, is that we can see incredible detail in that arc. So if I may have the last uh, image, and, ro and it's rotated 90 degrees, and we've zoomed in. So this is really fascinating to me. I've never seen anything quite like this before. This is a, the gravitationally lensed image of a single spiral galaxy that's like twice as far away from us as the intervening cluster. And so, on, and we call this the dragon just because it kind of looks cute uh, in that sense. But on the left side, you see an image of the galaxy, quite detailed with a lot of color information in it that we'd never seen before uh, we had taken this image. And then up on the upper right, you see an image, the, the tail, so that's the head of the dragon, and then the tail on the upper right, which is an image of the very same galaxy. And in between, you see the stretched out band of light, each which really is comprised of stretched out images, three or four additional images of this same galaxy. And this is what, I mean, it's just remarkable what gravitational lensing can do. And in particular, this is nature's telescope. This is taking the power of Hubble and enhancing it tremendously with gravitational lensing so that we can actually study detailed structures in galaxies that are incredibly far away. Another thing I can say is we don't see, a, normally you might see a counter example of this on the other side of the cluster. You don't see that, and that tells us the, the very particular special way that the dark matter is distributed within that cluster. So I'm proud to report that prior to this mission, we, with our instrument failures, we were down to three operating channels, instrument channels on Hubble. Today we have 13. We have six opera fully operating instruments today. I say fully operating, one of them, the Nick Moss, has just come back online. We're still in the process of checking it out, and it'll begin its science program a little bit later. But um, in addition to the instruments, I'm not able to report any 
failure or problem on the spacecraft itself. <laughs> so I, I know it was a tough mission, and I know there are a lot of travails, but somehow, some way, you guys pulled it off. You just refused to say die, and you kept going. And we have a fully functioning, uh, beautifully operating Hubble Space Telescope today. So with that, I'd like to turn it over for some closing comments, or nearly closing comments, to Heidi Hamill. Thanks, Dave. It is a wonderful coincidence that servicing mission four occurred in 2009, because as Administrator Bolden already said, 2009 is the International Year of Astronomy. This is the year we celebrate the 400th anniversary of Galileo turning his telescope to the skies and revolutionizing our understanding of the cosmos. The Hubble Space Telescope, in a sense, represents 400 years of technological innovation. Hubble's contribution to astronomical research is its ability to provide truly unique observations. The new equipment installed during the very successful mission uh, by the astronauts not only restores Hubble to its full operational mode, Hubble's new cameras and spectrographs propel us forward into a new beginning for astronomy and astrophysics. Hubble's new capabilities were tested quite dramatically and unexpectedly just seven weeks ago. Seven weeks ago, we got a report in the middle of the night that something had hit Jupiter. And once we convinced ourselves that that was, in fact, correct, all telescopes around the world turned to Jupiter. And the, the question that I grappled with was, well, what about Hubble? Fifteen years ago, exactly fifteen years ago, when a shattered comet, Shoemaker-Levy 9, had crashed into Jupiter, Hubble was at the forefront of the observations, and I had been at the helm of the Hubble team. So could we do it again? The trouble was that the astronauts had just finished their servicing mission, and the Hubble team was deep into what they call SMOVE, Servicing Mission Orbital Verification. This orbital verification is an extremely important part of the mission. No science is being done, but all the instruments are being checked, calibrated, exercised, so that we can make sure that the telescope 